o'clock and I'm going to call the meeting to order. All right. Are we ready to go? Thank you. Please join us in the salute to the flag. To the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Here. 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 So now we have public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Public comment for items not on the agenda. Okay, public comment is closed. Go to the consent agenda. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to pull item 3D for the purposes of discussion from the consent agenda. Okay. Any others? We have a motion. I a motion to approve consent agenda item 3A, 3B, 3C, and 3E. Second that. Any public comment? Roll call, please. Aye. Division three. Aye. Division four. Aye. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now we'll have three D, which is select property management contract change order and budget amendment for sixty thousand um, dollars. So thank you, everyone. I, I wanted to have just some general discussion around this, um, and I had a list of questions that I submitted to management this week. And I just want to kind of go over some of this and everybody else's information. So as, as most of you know, my career has been in real estate, both commercial and residential. And, and I have also had a property management company and so on. So I have something to say about some of this um, from, a, from experience. So I asked how many of the properties that are owned by NID are improved or residential? And the answer came back, there were 11. Now, you know what, Jen, I didn't ask, though, out of what are the total number that we own in that in the Centennial, I'm sorry, in, yeah, in the Bear River drainage? Uh, I, can, I can answer a lot of questions for you, I think. I figured. Okay. Well, we can come back to that. But I want everybody to know we own 11 houses, or, you know. Yeah, it was 12, 12. recently, but uh, we demoed a right. double-wide trailer. trailer. Yeah. Demoed. Demoed. Demolished. Demolished. Yeah. Demoed. And then I wanted to know of all of the ones that were that we have of the ten, um, how many are currently occupied? And the answer came back it was ten. Um, then I wanted to to understand and see a schedule of repairs and maintenance and improvements, and um, that was over five thousand dollars. A month. No, over five. I think of it in my world as like a capital capital improvement versus just a a repair maintenance okay so I had asked for a, a schedule for over 5,000 and um, Jen came back and said you know they don't have it organized quite like that as a schedule um, and she said the maintenance requests are made by the property manager and then they discuss it and then generally they approve the expense so I said what repairs are being scheduled to be included in the $60,000 budget amendment the answer came back. Currently, there are two activities in the queue: a renovation of general repairs to a property on Dog Bar for twelve thousand, and another property on Dog Bar for fifty-five hundred for repair to the roof from a falling tree. Other than the future unknown expenses, in twenty twenty-three, we spent one hundred sixty-six thousand on general repairs and management fees. So then I asked us of the management fees if they could break down um, what was you know, property management, and I think of that in terms of collecting rents and you're communicating with the tenants and you're handling the and those kinds of things, versus fees paid for like managing a project, which often are split up in the property management. And Jen said their fees are 7% of the rent, but they do not charge anything over and above. Is that still correct? That is correct. That is correct. That's good. That's good. Um, and then I asked, um, 
of the additional 20,000 in additional quotes for the work that's mentioned in the staff report, um, what are those things? And it was paint, drywall, deck repair, garbage disposal, you know, some of the just general residential kinds of things. And, um, and so I just said, often I have, as, as a property manager, I have concerns because sometimes those repairs are not necessarily necessary. And, um, and Jen reassured me that, that the way these are handled, if she approves these, they're here for health and safety of the tenants. So that covers all those things. Do you have something to add? Oh, I think, no, keep, keep no. going. I'll, okay. I'll ask well, any questions if there's still questions to be. Okay. And um, so, it, you know, just to wrap up, I've always been a little uncomfortable about us owning all these residential properties. And so I wanted to just have this opportunity to dive into it, get a little more information, which I did, and I appreciate staff answering the questions. So that's really it. I was just open for discussion. I think the one thing that I was going to mention, yeah. we talked about health and safety of the buildings. That is of, health and safety of the tenants within the building right. and the property. Right. As well as the health and safety and property ownership for all of the neighbors that we have bought these properties within. Right. Let's be clear, this, this, this was it, at various times somewhat controversial. Yes. Um, and so a lot of these properties are within neighborhood homeowner, homeowner associations. They have, they have road agreements that we contribute to. There are, there are road improvements that NID contributes to that the whole neighborhood agrees to. Um, there has been very few uh, improvements to the homes that once we have received indication from the tenant and then the property manager that, hey, there's a, there's a, a failing well, there's a pump that needs to be replaced, there's a roof, there's a tree that fell on a roof, there's a tree that fell through a fence line, there's a tree that, you know, um, whatever it be, there, there's aging. Yes. We've done most of those improvements in order to do a couple things. One is to keep the tenant health and the tenant's health and safety foremost and, and foremost. The property safe for the tenants around it. We've done a lot of tree clearing, we've done a lot of large vegetation removal on the, some of these properties are ten acres in size. Right. So we've done a whole bunch of, inf of product improvements. Um, to keep to keep our property that NID owns not the blight of the neighborhood. That's exactly. That's really my intent, and that has been, I think, the district's ambition throughout the ownership of these properties. And I think we've done relatively well, um, except these two last evictions. That that has really caught us a bit off guard. Um, like I said, one of the evictions we're demolishing the particular home that that individual is in. It is a it is a, a double wide trailer. I think that well the wheels are gone. Um, but it, it is not in a condition and it is not of structure that it can be repaired. Um, the other one part of this is, is a, basically an internal remodel of a renovation of, of the home that was left in bad disrepair. Things like prior tenant, prior tenant, just really trashed. And so we just need to make it uh, move in ready. Habitable? Habitable, if you will. Overall. Everything we're doing also improves the value of the property. I believe it does. Well, or it makes it habitable. I mean, you know, the fact that you have to replace toilets and roofs and things doesn't improve the value. It is assumed that a house will come with a toilet and roof, right? right? So, and and the the addition the additional funds that that we're requesting is just so that we don't have to come back to the board. I really don't know what's going to happen between August 28th and December 31st. Sure. Um, things have come up. Like I say, we've just many of these homes, all of these homes are on wells. Um, we've had to do, you know, um, UV, UV systems. I mean, some of these things are, are going to cost the money. So we, we spent last year $166,000, I think, overall. That was project management inclusive. Um, this brings us up to a total budget of around 160, so a little less than last year. Um, but then again, this year we had some big expenses that were unanticipated, and I can't really anticipate what those are. So it's really more in line with, with uh, expense of last year, kind of, even a little less. Um, if we don't spend it, it, the money just goes right back into general fund. And I'm not spending it just to spend it. 
we okay. no. And then the, my final comment is, and I, Jen and I talked about this, but the laws have changed really dramatically since July of this year for um, removing tenants. There's in favor of tenants' rights, and so for the purposes of our board's long-range planning, we need to keep in mind that it can take a very long time to remove tenants as a result of the changes in the law. So it's right. not a 30-day or even a 60-day process anymore. Yeah, yeah. We we currently most of our tenants um, have been with us for more than two or three or four years. Um, so thus far, all of them are on time. You know, they're they're making their payments. Um, so, anyway. Well, I support the budget amendment. I just wanted to dive into it a little bit for myself. So, thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, motion. Second. Well, is there any other questions? Yeah. I know. Well, I just wondered if there was other questions. I would get that out. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I would move that we approve the request for the budget amendment of $60,000. I'll second it. All right. Public comment? Seeing none, roll call, please. Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, we'll now go to PG. Huh. Like oh, I think generally. <laughs> oh, I think Craig is very well. We have a guest. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah. uh, good morning, board. And I think you're up. Okay. I'm uh, Seth Perez with pg &E. I'm a strategic agreement consultant, and I manage the coordinated operations agreement between pg &E and Nevada Irrigation. Uh, and I'm here today to give you um, an update on the status of the repairs to uh, our spalding system, uh, spalding one, spalding two, and the South Yuba pipe. Um, so at this time, um, we're continuing to deliver, I think, approximately 450 CFS into the drum canal um, out of the spalding one powerhouse, diverting approximately, I think, 65 CFS into the South Yuba canal uh, to be moved to Scotts Flat. Um, and Currently, the second outage for Spalding 1 is uh, scheduled for March 1 of next year to begin. And the advantage for that is why? Well, there's two things, right? We need to give the reservoir, the downstream reservoir, Scott's Flat and Rollins Reservoir, an opportunity to recharge, right? And then secondly, with the issues that have um, come up at Spalding 2, um, we need to continue to move that water um, so that we can make the repairs there because that, that water is not going to be available to move through the Spalding 2 powerhouse uh, until repairs are completed there. So Spalding 2, repairs to Spalding 1 is on March 1st? Second round of the outage there, right? There were two. Second horn. The second horn, that's right. And powerhouse 2, when is that scheduled to be repaired? That could be a dependent, right? The schedule is not finalized yet. Um, so, we, this week we have our vendor, our construction vendor. Um, they've opened up the unit and are investigating the extent of the damage, the internal damage there. Uh, last week we had a, a specialist out to um, assess the damage to the governor system that occurred as well. Um, and so we're working with our engineering team and our vendors to develop a plan um, and put a schedule together. So we were hoping to have one together by now, but the investigation is going a little slower than we had anticipated uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, but as soon as that's ready, we'll have that prepared. Um, I think the our, our hope is to have it, the repairs complete on Spalding 2 before the second round of the outage begins, right? So that we can start that outage and then start moving water through the Spalding 2 powerhouse through the South Yuba pipe. Um, in the event that those repairs can't be completed by March 1st, we have an alternative available to install a scroll case plug into the 
the Spalding 2 unit that would allow us to bypass water through our PRV there and move water into the South Yupa pipe. Um, we're waiting to implement that so that we can, so that the issue is we can't do the repairs and install the plug. Um, the, that, that would take away our lotto point on the Spalding 2 unit. We can't safely complete repairs on the, on the generator there. And so we're using, we'll use that as an alternative if it, if it looks like we can't complete the repairs to Spalding 2 by March 1st. And that would still continue, what, 200 second feet? I think we, the max we can get is about 140 um, into the South Yuba pipe. And so we would divert a portion of that into the South Yuba pipe and then spill the remainder into the Bear River for, to be delivered down to Rollins. And so we will working with NID PCWA to identify our kind of go, no go date on when we might need to implement that alternative. Um, and it would take us approximately two weeks, we think, to install that, that plug there. So if you start on the, okay, so start on the second horn, March 1st. Um, how long will it take to fix it? I think we're anticipating through July um, to, yeah, and, and that's with some float in the schedule, um, which is, we're still putting that together, so, um, but we're, we want to give ourselves some float this time around, right, so that if anything pops up during construction, we, we still, we have a buffer from um, the anticipated completion date. What happens if we expect Rollins to fill, Scott's flat being the problem? But what happens if Rollins doesn't fill before we, then? We won't. We will ask for the second horn to be outage to be moved. Okay. Which is prudent. Are you willing to do that? Uh, I think so. A lot of all of the decisions we've made have been heavily influenced by our ability to deliver water and you know make sure that the agencies are able to get water to their customers. So um, you, you know I think we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But it's definitely something that we're open to. I think. And we, we've had the discussions with them several times, so they're aware yeah. of what our concerns are. It would probably be decision made January, February time frame. It just seems four months to repair that one horn seems like a long time. Yeah, it does. There is, as Seth stated, a little bit of float in the system um, or in the schedule. It, hopefully it would be done faster, but that's what the schedule shows as of right now. How long did it take you to do the horn one? So mid-March to end of July. So however many months that is, four, about four months there. Yeah. Pillars. That's that's correct. I think we're going to do some some once we drain the the tunnel, we'll go and do some some finishing touches there. But um, that's no the extent of that is. Have you guys looked at the discharge horn in Spalding 2? Have those been inspected? And are there two or only one? There's one, one PRV there. Um, okay, so Spalding 2, so yeah. I'm clear. So Spalding 2 has one horn? That's correct. Okay. And yeah. have, have, has it been inspected? Do you know the condition of it? Um, I think it has, but I'll, I have to get back with you and confirm that. Yeah. But, and, and that's, that's a risk, right? So that, that PRV, isn't designed for continuous bypass regularly, right? So we're we're planning to implement a, a regular inspection cadence. If if in the event we have to kind of go to that alternative, we're going to be doing a, a really regular inspection on that as we're bypassing water through it. You're going to be doing a regular inspection. Does that mean you haven't been doing regular inspection? No, 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 no. It's it's we don't typically use it for continuous bypass is what I mean, right? So we're, we'll be adjusting our inspection cadence to to match that continuous, uh, the, yeah, the continuous use. Because it's, it's usually only used as a, when the unit trips to regu regulate the pressure there, right? So it just does it temporarily. But if we ins install that plug, we would be doing it continuously and would need to up the inspection cadence to match that change of use. Okay. No, I just want to make sure I understand this sequencing, so I think I'll restate and you can correct.
correct where I'm wrong. Okay, happy to. Okay, so um, currently we have 450 CFS going into the Drum Canal, of which 65 CFS goes into the South Yuba Canal to Scotts Flat. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. And I, I think, what are you getting at the bottom, Chip? Seven-ish. Um, the repair of Horn 2 is scheduled for March, 20, March 1st, 2025, and you expect that to continue through July 2025. Correct. And then um, if Rollins does not fill, we push out the repair date to the end of the irrigation season. Um, I, I don't know that we would have, we have timing confirmed at this, at this time, but we, that would definitely be an option to push out the repairs to Horn 2. So from Jennifer and the team, I'd like to understand what the implications are for service delivery next year if we push out that repair to the after the end of the irrigation season. Yeah, there, we are, as of right now, not recommending we remove the 20% conservation request. So we would stay in the 20% Correct. Conservation. So you're and we'll make it February not doing a, a surplus water declaration next year. I don't know that we've addressed that yet, but um, <clears throat> I'm not. We'd have to talk through with Dustin and Chip to see where we land. Um, you missed uh, one of the triggers. The first trigger is actually spalding too. So they don't if they're not going to finish in time. Three one date doesn't start. Like Correct. That. Yes. Thank you. We have a very good summary. <laughs> yes, that was well done. <laughs> I have a question to follow up on that. Uh, I have this correct with, with the time frame she's talking about. Unit one is taken off for the repair of horn two. What happens to uh, water going down a drum for uh, for a PCWA? There's no water going into drum, is that correct? The only water going down south of the from units. They can pull water off Lake Valley Reservoir. Yeah, and then the plan would be to have Spalding 2 back up and running so that we could spill some water into the Bear River. Spill water back the other way. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Welcome. The uh, South Yuba Pipeline. Oh, South Yuba pipe repairs. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's that's going really well. Um, the the fitting and welding is on schedule and is anticipated to be complete um, early to mid September, as as previously communicated. So that's on track. Now we just have to figure out our schedule for this welding two unit itself. Do you expect? What will we have that at the next meeting then? Do you think? Um. Yeah, I think we should have something together. The next few weeks, I think, just based on the information they're getting this week, with being inside the the, the generator and um, having met with the the gener uh, governor specialist last week. So I, I hope to have a schedule and to, to share that with uh, NID staff as soon as it's available. I'm a little still concerned about March 1st, 2025, uh, because you're giving yourself five months. To do maybe uh, a three-month job, and we're not going to go through what we went through this year as a as a district. I put too much stress on us, on all the workers, every everybody receiving water, not receiving water. Um, so I guess my message was tighten up that repair schedule and get it done a lot faster. So we'll do everything we can to do it as quickly as, and safely as we can. And good. I guess I can't say that strong enough. I think consistent with that is um, the pushing back of the timeline was, I mean, I, and I can understand it in the instance for Hoeing One, but it is very stressful to hear that it's going to be you know, April, then it's going to be May, and then it's going to be the end of May, then it's going to be mid-June, then it's, you know, and it just kept going on and on, and it, it, it really undermines the credibility of the company when, and I'm not talking to NID, I'm talking PG, 
PG&E that you can't, we can't count on what the timeline schedule is. And I get it, you were discovering things, but that discovery should be kind of in place for the most part, one would think for Horn 2, because you just built, rebuilt Horn 1. And, and, yeah. and, and it's informing our, our schedule there. So, um, you know, the, the long lead time the project is again going to be the welding, right? It's it's a small space and it's very uh, it takes a long time to do all those welds between the the, the joints on the the liner. So uh, again, that's really kind of the big piece of it is, is the welding component. You've been welding this one for how long? Which one? Welding one. Yeah. The the welding hasn't started on the on the second horn at all. Oh, no, I understand, but the first horn. Yep. It's complete. complete. Right. Yeah. So they completed less than a month. Yeah, I'd have to I'd have to go back and compare this. Schedule. Doesn't sound like it's that. Uh, I I, I mean I, I think the you know the welding was the big driver on the first horn as well. Correct. We but, just want to make sure you put forth the same level of effort that you put forth on the first horn in the second one. So you had a staff working 24-7. Um, seven days a week. Seven days a week. Yeah, and that's the, you know, that's what we would expect for this repair as well, given that our customers are relying on that water and it creates um, hardship both for our customers and the district to manage our system without full, a fully functioning system. So, um, and I think the company did, uh, you know, obviously you're putting in 24 seven, you can't work any harder than people did. And you got the contractors in place. So we want to see that same level of effort in the next pair of Horn 2. Actually a little more efficiency because they've done it once. Right, yeah. And if someone takes a lot, you know, hour off for lunch, somebody else takes its place in, in the hole. Welding. I, how do you account economically for all this, all the costs? Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to go uh, <clears throat> talk with our uh, accountants and analysts. You do have that. Is that available? Um, I'm not sure. That's available. Um, I have an additional question that came to me as we were all talking. So fast forward, we've got you know the repair to Horn One done. We're going to have the repair to Horn Two done. This equipment still is aging, or is is aged. You're just doing kind of repairs to already a very old system. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. So, um, what is the anticipated life, if you will, of the repairs that you're doing? In other words. When could we expect the same kind of disaster to happen? Or, you know, what, yeah, what is the life of these repairs? I guess that's the best way to say it. I, I, I don't have a, a definite, you know, year range on that, oh, it. right? But, um, you know, the, when the horns in Spalding 1 were first replaced, those, those liners had been there for 80 years. Understood. Right, and so then this this was really kind of um, a surprise to see that that had these had failed after we had made re replaced them, and you know, you know about ten years ago. I know. That's so and so it's it's uh, you know I, I think when we're looking at a a life of the assets we're installing, we're we're looking at something closer to the, the first range versus the second, right? So. Um, but yeah, a I longer term. For the difference between yeah. 80 years versus 10 years. Like, what? Like, yeah. What is the? Like, I, I can answer that. Well, let's let him answer. I would answer. Are you using Chinese steel or American? I I I, can I think that type of material is different, and then there are some different operations at the powerhouse. I, I don't know that there were any operations at the powerhouse that were different, but the. Have we received clarification on that? Yep. We've asked related to um, continuously running additional water through the powerhouse horns once the powerhouse was derated. As far as I know, the operation of the powerhouse didn't, didn't change. Okay. Between before the installation of that and after. <clears throat> Is the 
Sorry, were you going to say something else? Is the root cause analysis oh, completed? Oh, that's where I was going to go. As well. uh, it's it's, it's uh, not yet completed. Okay. All right, any public comment? This is a workshop, so you can jump in. I see Brandon Sanders out there. Thank you, Brandon, for listening. Any questions from the public? So I think I All right. Uh, WTQT Farm Bureau. And this isn't specifically for Seth, but um, even just driving here, I'm hearing this uh, really nice NIT commercial on the radio. That says that uh, ditch rotation is continuing. Is that true, or is that just an old commercial? An old commercial. Okay, so that's still running. Is that <laughs> Thank you. Know. Appreciate it. Thanks. Great. Any further questions? Thank you for showing up and being here and answering their questions. Thanks for having me on September 11th. And okay, yeah, if, if, if you want to see her, I'll, I can come back and give you an update. Oh, we'd like that. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Seth. All right. So now we'll go to general order and by the cost allocation plan. Um, yeah, Sandra is back in action here. So welcome back to Sandra. She has a very healthy baby boy named Luke. Hey, Congratulations. Luke. All right. And we are here to discuss cost allocation plan. As the board is aware, once we opened up Fund 70, which is essentially houses, all the administrative and overhead expenditures, when we did that, we developed a very simple cost allocation methodology in order to distribute the cost proportionally between the main operating funds, Fund 10, Water, Fund 30, Recreation, and Fund 50, Hydro. And that was essentially based off of a blended calculation of the number of staff and revenue received. In order to shore up the cost allocation, we had a, we initiated a full cost allocation study that was completed by consultants. And once the cost allocation is completed and we wanted to present it to the board, um, request consideration of approval of cost allocation, and then the new cost allocation will inform the budget, and then we'll inform subsequent um, budget projections for the rate setting process. So this is some of the effort that's leading us into the rate setting process. So with that, we will go, we have a consultant online that is going to provide a brief presentation, ask any questions as we're going along. The cost allocation can be a little bit complicated, um, but he'll walk us through it. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Great. We sure can. Welcome, Tony. He was with Financial, so he'll present. Hello, everyone. Uh, would you like me to share my screen and do the presentation or on your end? Yeah, that would be great. You got it. Okay. So while I'm bringing that up, thank you for your time. And I'm going to hopefully go through this and make it as, you know, um, uh, understandable as I can without getting too into uh, any technical jargon or anything like that. But if you do have any questions as I'm going through it, just stop me at any time. Okay. Uh, so I'll just kind of start off with what we're talking about, what the cost allocation plan is, what it does, that sort of thing, right? So really, cost allocation plan's purpose is to identify the functions of an organization, um, how they're providing that support, and allocate uh, those support costs to the units that they are uh, supporting, right? So we want to make sure that we're ensuring uh, that the cost allocation plan is reflecting a, a appropriate or reasonable allocation to those units. Uh, it itself is a, it's a tool that does the allocation calculation itself. We build all our models in Excel. Uh, they need to be specifically catered around each organization that we're working with. So 
Uh, it's based off of your agency's uh, expenditure budget, uh, how it's formatted, how it looks, and, and how we incorporate all the data needs to conform to that. And at the end of the process, we want to make sure that, again, that the allocations are um, reasonably representing how support is being provided, and I'll discuss how we go about doing that. So the primary building blocks of the model is to first identify what the central the central services of, an of your agency are so that we can then identify what the central functions of each of those services are, right? Uh, so, you know, within finance, you know, there's purchasing and, all, and accounting and all those other functions uh, that we want to allocate out. Once we identify those functions, we then talk about uh, with, with your staff how they're providing support uh, to the operating units, your funds. Uh, and then identify distribution bases, which is just data sets, the so data sets that you have internally that could represent how that support is being provided. So for human resources, the number of personnel, right, uh, that each fund has is a good measure of how support is being provided, those sort of thing. And then the model uses that information to allocate the costs. So graphical representation, right, we have our central functions there in the left, and we're going to allocate that cost out to the funds. Uh, we actually do it at the department level for the calculations, and then we roll it up at the end. So I'll show you both uh, through this presentation. And then here is kind of the, the steps of the process. We want to do a kickoff meeting so that we kind of lay the groundwork where where your agency was at, you know, at the start, how your allocation plan um, was formulated prior, and then what's the plan of action moving forward. We collect a lot of financial and expenditure data, right? So your org structure, the budget, the revenues, and a bunch of other information so that we can try to get a good lay of the land on how you all operate. And then we develop our Excel model around that data to make sure that it fits to the way that, um, uh, that you all operate and how your budget is formatted and that, how your departments are structured and things of that nature. <clears throat> and we discuss with finance uh, what cost, what each uh, expenditure code means, what, what type of costs are within each one. So we're make, making sure that the model knows how to treat each of the object codes, departments, and every other part of your budget structure. Uh, we review your current cost allocation plan for how it was formula uh, formulated, not primarily like what was the result, right? How were those allocations flowing? Uh, just to try to see if we can identify if there was anything that when we're doing that organizational check uh, for central functions, if we're missing anything, or if there's certain things we identify that weren't in there previously. Uh, so things like engineering was included in this round, which wasn't included in the prior. <clears throat> Then we identify uh, those central functions as well as the services that they are, they reside within, uh, identifying what can be allocated, what shouldn't be allocated uh, based off of identifying, it. is it a support cost uh, to those funds? And all throughout the process, from the beginning to the end, we're having meetings and emails with staff to make sure that we are fully understanding how the organization operates, uh, any data sets that we're using are, are being used appropriately based off of kind of what uh, I'd say like, you know, using FTEs for human resources, is that a good measure for how, um, how support is being provided? So all throughout the process, showing how the calculations are being done and walking that through, make sure that it's all reasonable. Here's an example of kind of how that looks. Uh, so if we identify a central function, we then attach it to data sets uh, based off of, a, you know, a reasonable basis of how support is being provided. Uh, we do, while this isn't a federally compliant plan uh, that I'm going to be showing you, it, what it is, um, it still conforms to their policies and procedures and recommendations for how plans should be devised. And so there's certain fallbacks to use if we don't have a data set available. So for accounting, uh, it's primarily based off of what your largest departments and funds are. So that is a heavier weight in their allocation. But there's also a personnel factor being accounted for. So there's a 75-25 split in there. For communications, there's not a direct data set that's being collected that can tell us exactly how they're providing support throughout your organization. So our fallback is typically gonna be either, should we allocate based off of the number of personnel or is it more of the size of the department fund that is the driver for how allocation should go? And so uh, as is typical, we use total cost for that. Uh, so that's 100% of the way that was allocated. Directors, uh, so for the directors, we allocated based off a three-way split of total cost, FTEs, and how many agendas, right? So what are the activities within the organization that are happening in the past year that could dictate how support and flow should go? So while we have, uh, I'd say the first two of uh, total costs and FTEs is a measure of potential, 
the agenda is also it gives a good measure of what has been so that we can also account for um, you know certain nuances within your organization. Human resources, I mentioned using FTEs, but we also do a weighting factor based off salaries and benefits. So the higher positions do have a weighting uh, effect of that allocation. And for purchasing, we're using total purchase orders. <clears throat> now, this slide's showing you there's more than just those examples. Uh, Donnie, with, yeah, go ahead. Can we go back to the last slide? Yeah. So um, what is the rationale for weighting salaries and benefits? I mean, is it found that higher salaried employees take more effort from the HR department? What's the foundation for that? So typically it is, that I'd say for most, it is included because there is more cost involved with hiring, recruiting, onboarding, and, that, and those sort of activities. Uh, so it, it doesn't necessarily provide a big impact on that because more bodies is more salaries anyway, but uh, it does have some level of, of uh, effect. If you do have some higher uh, cost positions within a certain department, they would get more of an allocation than a lower cost than another. I just I find that modified total direct cost is an interesting category um, because it's it's hard to assess whether um, and I'm sure with your experience you know these things to play out but it's hard for me to understand how one's budget is a at least I'm assuming that's one's total budget under to modified total direct cost. Um, how that ties to communications versus, um, you know, kind of where we spend time as a district communicating about our programs and services. So that, that one kind of I find interesting. I don't know how else you would do it, but um, it, it doesn't, I don't see really the connection between the total budget and how the district is spending effort toward its communications program. Yeah, I'll, I'll take you a step further. It, it's much more nebulous than any others on there. I agree with you there. Uh, so communications has been a thing that has been popping up more and more over the past like five, seven years. Uh, and without there being a tracking of, you know, or we're, you know, doing these communications and things of that nature with without there being that sort of uh, data set that we can tie to, we, this is where the OMB cost principles or federal cost principles come into play, where they say, look, if there's not a data set that can provide a good link to how service provided, we know it's still a central function though to allocate, then use the budget uh, or actual as a way to allocate. Now, for modified total direct costs, I didn't define it. That comes out of the cost principles as well. And really what that is, it, it is the budget, but we're excluding certain cost items because they overinflate budgets for the purposes of doing an allocation. So capital, debt, and transfers are excluded from that. So that those sort of costs do not overinflate how we're sending costs. So it's really just the personnel and the operating costs that they have surrounding uh, their operations, which are affecting that allocation. So it's trying to narrow it down to, well, what are the operations that um, that we need to account for for our total cost allocation? I, I appreciate that explanation. That makes it clearer to me. And, you know, in the big scheme of things, communications is not a huge expenditure. So it's a, but you have a, a methodology for making that, that alignment as you have. So that's good to know. Yeah, and it's a good point too, because if while we're using these data sets, um, as was mentioned, this model is going to be the agencies to use moving forward. And so if new data sets become, you, know, you have them on hand and you can use them, a, the plan can be updated, drop in a new data set, and that can be the new allocation methodology. So as time progresses, if those, if anything of the sort is, is tracked, uh, that would be a better fit, then it can be just plugged right in. That's great. And so, yeah, uh, so yeah, the communications is the smallest of the allocations uh, for each of those. Uh, so like you said, right, it's not the biggest one. Uh, and here are the other central functions that were included. Uh, we are not allocating certain costs within the engineering and administration. What we're cutting out for engineering is a depreciation expense that's in there. 
And then from admin, we're not allocating the debt service for the PERS and OPEP. Uh, so those are being excluded uh, within there. So that's that big amount. On the other side of the coin, right, this is what we're allocating out, that 14 million. This is where it was going. So the plan allocated out uh, to each of these departments. So it's showing here at the department level uh, based off of those data sets that are used. But more interest typically is rolling it up. This is what it looks like at the fund level. So um, of that 14 million, uh, nine went to the water, uh, 676,000 electric and 4.4 million to hydro. And then the percent split is actually um, very close to what you currently had. So it was, it was kind of, it, it's nice to see. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's one of those things where we, we go through this full kind of study and, and go through all these alloc these allocations and, and calculations. And, and then when you end up with the result is about a 1% difference than what you were currently doing. Uh, <laughs> it it's, can be funny to see, but it, it really just means you know, total costs and, and what you're currently using as a personnel factor. They are heavy factors to use in allocation anyway. Um, so it wasn't, it, we didn't anticipate it to deviate a whole lot from what you were currently doing, but uh, now you just, you kind of have a, a more fully fleshed out plan, right? And so Tony, this is more defendable. Yeah, especially since we're going to, this feeds into the budget, which feeds right. into the Prop 218. Yep. Thank yep. you. Yeah, exactly. We want to make sure, so while it's not using the federal cost principles, um, it is in compliance with Prop 218 under California law, so to make sure that you have a defensible allocation structure. Uh, for doing any kind of, you know, rate making. Okay. And questions, I, we have a disclaimer in here. I'm not, I'm not a municipal advisor and I'm not providing such services. So that's this whole list of jargon in here, but that's that. And go back and I'll stop right here. And I and staff are here to answer any questions you might have. I, I just have a comment that this to me was one of the most important financial issues to address um, when I joined the board, when Jennifer joined. So I really appreciate your work and um, and I think it goes to the, the fact that our, after this analysis shows that we're so close to the analysis that you had already done, just shows the competence of our team here um, that you could look at that information and the way to allocate correctly and you come in almost right on the nose. Um, so I, I really appreciate it. This to me is very reassuring in how we're managing our finances. I want to be sure to thank Corey because he kept it afloat while I was on maternity leave. So thank you Corey, for getting the data. <laughs> um, so yeah, we did the contract right before I went out and had a meeting or two and then he kept the data floating to them, and then we picked it up when I came back. So Perfect. it was great. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. Thank I you, Corey. Okay. Um, so I did note that um, the engineering department was determined to be an overhead cost and move to Fund 70, and that is a change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so how was that determined? If determination made, can someone give a little background on? Well, and if you remember. Um, in prior year budgets, we were already doing an engineering allocation. So we were essentially doing two allocations, right? We were doing this, the old one was 65-530. And then on top of that, we were doing an engineering allocation to recreation and hydro. So we just consolidated into one. So we were already doing it for the district. And, and engineering really does help all of the departments. Right. So we'll use the factor each year. We'll look at the number of CIP projects per each fund, and then it'll just this allocation accordingly in engineering specific. So as Tony mentioned, this plan goes down to the department level. I mean, this workbook is massive and it does iteration and iteration and iteration to then roll up to the fund. So it is very, very detailed and very detailed. <laughs> It sets the stage for everything. Yeah, 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 it sure does. And so it could change each year, right? So each year we'll put new data in there, FTEs, um, if anybody moves around, CIPs, costs, and, and so hopefully it remains pretty consistent, which the district seems to be pretty consistent, but it could change from year to year. What, so a, diff what a difference four years make. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and, and Jennifer, Sandra, Greg, everybody, yeah. thank you. So the foundation of the system is something now we 
can manage ourselves and update with new data? We'll probably have them update it. It's a nominal fee just okay. because the, the workbooks are complex enough that you could easily break some links and mm -hmm. calculations. Okay. Yeah, we, we talked about doing it in-house and I think at least another year or two doing it side by side until we're more comfortable with the workbook because it is a massive workbook. Yeah, that seems prudent. Thank you. Any public comments? Public comment? Seeing none. Uh, Do we need a motion? Yeah, is this a receiving file? No, or that one. Approve the, to approve the cost allocation plan. Oh, approve the cost I would move that we approve the cost allocation plan as presented by our staff and. Well, I always want to say wild and wild. Wild and I know a Wilden. Wilden, thank you. Yes, and Wilden, thank you. Second. Uh, no more conversation. Roll call, please. Division two. Aye. 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 Yes. Yes. Andrew, great work. Thank you, Tony. Excellent, Corey. You're out there. Thanks. He's out there. Right. He's out there. Good job, Thank Corey. Thank you, Good, Tony, and your team. Very nice. All right, so we're going on to 5B, which is uh, Tyler Munis, ERP project, and it's a relaunch. Yes. Been a long Good morning, board. Jeez. Listen, <laughs> general manager. Um, bring this item to you with a little bittersweet. Start with a little bit of the bitter, and then we'll end with the sweet. Um, so we're bringing to you today uh, a resolution seeking to um, award a contract with Tyler Munis ERP for a not to exceed of $1,783,433 and approve a capital budget amendment into fund 70 of $393,393,031. There's a bit of a typo on the original resolution. I'll just get that out of the way. Uh, and so we do have to make an adjustment to the resolution before. Um, so I'll go through this uh, briefly, just historical, and then we can answer questions if you have them as we move through. We have a representative from Tyler online, so technical questions if you have them regarding the ERP and, and CMMS, which is the EMS program. Um, we have John uh, Ortiz, who's our IT administrator in the room as well, and Sandra, obviously, with our finance. So, so uh, bringing in the big guns to answer some questions if you may have them forward. Um, so looking backwards for a minute, uh, in 2019, the board approved Resolution 2019, which is uh, to implement the ERP and CMMS project uh, with a budget of $2.7 million. Um, that pot, that that uh, project implementation back then included uh, ERP software uh, licensing and implementation. It included CMMS configuration and content data. Uh, it also included uh, contract contract management for project management for the project itself for two specific uh, contractors at the time. Um, the the project, which is number 2295, um, was the design, development, and implementation of both systems simultaneously. And they were two completely different systems. One was, uh, well, they were two completely different systems. One was the financial management system of Pentamation, and another was a computerized maintenance management system, or CMMS, from a company called Lucidy. Uh, NID identified that prior to this, both of our both of our legacy programs um, for financial management and computerized systems were inefficient, um, outdated, and did not support the complex operations um, uh, of the district moving forward. In 2018, so, so in 2018, we started looking at this, the district as a whole. Um, we have questions you can ask. but. Okay. No, All right. That's okay. Just commenting that, 
you know, okay. All right. Okay. Rude is okay. I'm okay. No. <laughs> Once. Um, so in 2018, we designed a uh, two two paths. Uh, the first was for a request for information from nine different, well, from firms uh, that had to do with the ERP software management system of the district. Um, we went out to nine firms for request, request for information. Um, from that, we developed a request for proposal. That request for proposal went out and we received nine response, or I'm sorry, three responses from the ERP side of the software program. Um, uh, and out of that program, out of that request for proposal program, Tyler Technologies, Tyler was the chosen choice with, from um, the uh, request for proposals that were received back then. Tyler is a provider of the ERP or they're an integrator of someone else's ERP? So they're a provider of the ERP. Yeah, and they're government focused. They only do government. Some of these other softwares do private sector and everything. So that's probably why the district chose them back then. Yeah, the three at the time, um, the three that came to us as a proposal, an actual request for proposal that were completed, uh, there were companies called Harris Enterprise, uh, Edmonds and Associates, and then Tyler were the three. No uh, more. Um, the request for information that went out originally went to groups like Microsoft, uh, NetSuite, Ramco, Cogsdale. So I don't see Oracle on that list. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Can you refresh my memory what ERP stands for? Enterprise Resource, resource Management. Enterprise Resource Program. Program. Our financial, human resources, accounting software program. Concurrently, at the same time, NID conducted a analysis of requirements for EMMS package, which is, which is all assets included within systems, particularly the hydroelectric um, department, um, um, power plants, as everything's broken down into subcategories and then you categorize schedule of maintenance, et cetera. Well, treatment plants, that sort of thing. Um, a, a, a group of staff and consultants were defined and talked about different requirements that we would need. We had our consultant go out and do a cross industry search of different organizations out there and sort of tried to match um, what our requirements were versus what was out there in the market at the time. Um, that consultant looked at, I think, eight or nine different organizations and companies that were providing this software program and came back and there was conversation and that consultant recommended that five different companies come and give presentations to this suite of, of staff and, and users at NID and so there were there were presentations given by these organizations. Um, Setaru was chosen as probably the most the most beneficial to the district at the time for the CMMS program. It was not part of the Tyler program. There were two completely separate organizations and firms and software programs. Um, the aim of the overall was to implement new software and technology across the entire organization. Um, The original scope was ambitious. It was time consuming. Tyler had, I think, 26 or so plus different applications that was to come online on the district resources, um, simultaneously bringing on a powerful and very aggressive CMMS program. And implementing those two together proved to be disastrous and not necessarily in the best interest of the district. Um, we attempted a coordinated approach to unify these systems. Um, the timeline was to start in, uh, in quarter three of 2029 and complete in 2021. Um, 
a lot of effort and a lot of time went into the development of the CMMS data. So all of the bill of materials essentially to a powerhouse, to a water treatment plant, the, the schedule of updates and maintenance and changes and the resources needed to complete all that was uh, took a lot of effort, a lot of thought and a lot of time. And we have a lot of that information still. That information is not throwaway, it's still valid. Um, uh, but it did consume a large portion of that project funding over the period. Mm -hmm. um, as we moved through the process as well, uh, it, was, it was made clear to us that Ceteru, who was the company that we had hired to do the program and the software, um, gave us note that they were no longer carrying the CMMS product line. They were bought up. The, that product line was discontinued from their services, and therefore, there was no more work to be done on it. Um, in total, Project 2295 spent a little over $2.7 million. We have, uh, through that process, like I say, a, a large body of work that was done to complete the data analysis and the implementation of a future CMMS program. We have the bill of materials. We have scheduling, we have maintenance activities for a lot of hydroelectric plants, for a lot of our water treatment systems. I can't tell you exactly to what degree and what level, but we did do a lot of work there that I think will be able to be transferred. Um, we also have ERP software licenses within this package that that are valued. You know, I noted in the staff report, a little over $600,000 worth of software licenses that we will continue through the Tyler system. So we're going to continue with the Tyler. Um, but first, I just want to be clear that, you know, we, we did run into some difficulties, uh, you know, in, in, in sort of a post-mortem analysis of this process, uh, we've come up with a number of activities that we can not replicate in the future. Um, in, inadequate internal management coupled with deliverables that were probably a little too far out of reach. Um, Unrealistic scopes ultimately led to Ceteru announcing they were not going to complete anything, and they basically walked away from the program. Um, COVID-19 seemed to be, uh, you know, it put its face in there somewhere. Uh, you know, really, there was internal communication issues, and um, we had some key stakeholders who were, who were important to shepherd these big, large projects forward were gone. Some people left. So we lost a lot of, we lost a lot of drive. We lost a lot of um, ambition and priorities change. So, so, sweet. That's the bitter. The sweet um, is that uh, this, this, this adjustment to our ERP and our, and our financial management system and our back end systems, as well as our CMMS project work still needs to be updated. We still have antiquated systems. Um, we have spent a lot of time lately over the last couple of years working and talking with Tyler a lot and adjusting the original scope and the, and the early phases of what our needs were. And we've actually whittled down a lot of uh, costly applications that were initially part of the initial program. And we've determined internally and through our conversations uh, that some of these things aren't necessary. Some things like bid management, contract management, employee expense reimbursement, some of these things that come at a cost, some larger, some not so much, but we've, we've, made, a, we've made a solid effort to go through the list of, of uh, applications and we determine we don't need a Cadillac version. We need, you know, something a little less than that. Greater than a, maybe a Pinto. <laughs> um, not a pinto. Not a pinto. Um, so within that, Tyler, over the period of time, has transferred all of their uh, all of their work to um, or programs, and I'm a little outside of my scale here, but but uh, to uh, instead of on on premises activities, to more of a cloud based. So a lot of benefits to that scalability. Uh, lower costs, long-term lower maintenance, um, automatic updates and maintenance by the company themselves, not by us and our staff. Um, 
and accessibility. It's a web base. We can access this stuff wherever we have internet capability and 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 uh, and the desire. Uh, timeline and cost now. So we have we we have been actively working with Tyler to produce both not only the ERP but they have their own um, CMMS program which they call Enterprise uh, Asset Management EAM. We've scheduled that out a couple years instead of simultaneously with the ERP. Uh, page four of the staff report identifies a four-phased approach that we anticipate moving forward. Um, one is to book financial package, which is inclusive of things like accounting, accounts payable, budgeting, capital assets, uh, management, inventory, management, grants, um, accounting and management. So that's, that's sort of phase one from a period of November of this year, uh, should the board approve this resolution and item um, out through January. So we do have a continuum of time. It's going to take quite a bit of, quite a bit of months. Phase two, um, starting within that same period, but but a slightly different is our human resources packages. Um, that's uh, talent management, payroll with employee access, so employees can access certain elements of their their particular um, uh, employee database. Um, those are sort of phase one, phase two. Phase three, utility billing. Uh, starting anticipated next year, which is accounts receivable, cashiering, general billing. So we'll build that in as we as we become more comfortable and build up the financial package. We we then fold in um, utility billing. You can see that that goes for about a year's worth of time out to November of 26. And then finally, phase four in January of 26, we start developing and integrating the uh, the Enterprise Asset Management, their EAM program, as well as system-wide applications, um, onboarding. Um, we're asking today that we we do have a budget um, that we that we award the 1.7 million dollars 783 to Tyler for this uh, implementation and project. Um, let's see. There might have been some confusion in the budgetary impact. There's a, uh, on page five of the staff report, um, this addition of 393.031 into um, fund 10 is, or fund 70, um, is to, that would increase fund 70's capital, capital asset or capital investment by the 393. So that's a total of 2.5. There, there's other projects within that Fund 70 capital asset or capital investment program. Um, that's that was maybe the confusion of that number. Um, and watershed projects and yeah. some ADA projects. Like that's right. Know. Watershed projects that are also in Fund 70. Yeah. Yeah. So the labor split is 70% NID, 30% Tyler. This total amount is that 70% remains in-house, or does the total amount go to Tyler? The total amount goes to Tyler. That, this is authorizing the um, contract as well as the budget amendment for the contract. The budgets for normal staff salaries are already in the... For Tyler. Yeah. And then, uh, how full is the cloud getting? <laughs> there's not one cloud. There's not one. I understand There's millions that. of clouds. Okay. But, uh, do we have an internal background uh, backup for our own records? Good question, John or Keith, maybe the administrator. Um, yes, uh, we do have an internal backup. We do backup to the cloud ourselves. We have talked to Tyler, to their SaaS individuals, so um, I'm confident that we can house our financial data into the cloud. Okay. But if the cloud something happens to the cloud or whatever wherever it is. Well, I mean, AI, right now it's, I'm hearing data centers are having a hard time getting enough energy. AI is going to increase the demand for energy in worldwide by 160%. It's, how does this all work? Well, I just want to have a, I want to have a secure backup here on site or somewhere where we grab it that is not Dependable on, depends on the uh, cloud or something else. So Tyler has multiple sites, so we can access it from anywhere. And like I said, I'm, I'm confident that if we put that into the cloud, we'll be okay. 
But to answer your question realistically, I mean, it's that's a problem that everybody faces. And but not is everybody addressing it. I mean, my, I can go get my backup out of my safe and reboot my accounting program. Can we do the same so thing? We, we do back up our software. We back up our application. We back up our data. Not only do we back it up locally, but we also send it off into the cloud right again. But we replicate and we duplicate our backups. That's the answer. So we, have great. Double, we have double backup? We probably have triple backup. Triple backup. Okay. Perfect. That's, that's pretty comforting. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Thank you. And then um, we did a cost of service study, what, five years ago? Or so longer ago. Yeah. Um, we will we will need to do a new one with using Tyler or and the previous. They're not really linked together. Tyler is just a financial management system. A cost of service study is related to rates, and it just pulls data out of it. Right. I'm not quite sure. Well, but okay, but we can. Well, we just approved on. Uh, That's a cost allocation. Yeah. The cost allocation is not really related to Tyler either. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'm not following what your question is. Well, we did a cost of service study um, <clears throat> six years ago. Right. And um, I guess the first question is, can we trust the numbers? And two, do, are we going to do a second one based on what we've done today? Um, any of well, that's not really related to this item. This is just Not to Tyler, right, but yeah. the previous item probably. Yeah, maybe we can talk offline so I can understand. I'm not really following what you're asking. Okay. All right, but, but then do we need to do a new cost of service study? To change rates, you yes. want to yeah, do Yeah, but that's part of rate setting. I'm not <clears> sure <throat> how that's associated with cost allocation or this item. Well, Tyler seems we get better numbers, right? Yeah, but we're not going to. We, Tyler implementation will take much longer than rates will. So, so yeah. yeah, and the data that's input into Tyler is only as good as what we transfer over and then what we subsequently input. So it, it's not a tool that we're going to be relying on for cost of service analysis for this next rate study, but Tyler should enable us to track things better and not have all this kind of um, I mean, it does, cost book tracking. Bill Dan? The cost allocation is an input into Tyler through the budget, essentially. <laughs> Tyler is a software where we uh, process all financial transactions and accounting through for the district. Bill Dan is inputs. Will Dan is an input essentially that informs the budget. It also cost, cost allocates. Yes, into the budget. Yes. Identify. Well, in a yeah, in, in an indirect way. In your brains, I want to connect them together. They're not, they're not joined at the hip. They're not going to be working in unison. One feeds information into the other. Okay. Go ahead, Jared. Chris. Uh, I, I think whenever we have a situation like this where we've made a pretty significant investment of both time and resources, it's disappointing. To have to come to this point in the road so I just want to acknowledge that um, I want to also highlight a sentence in the report on page one that says both the legacy software files were identified as largely inefficient outdated and not fully supporting the complex function of NID so that observation was made about the original software dating back to 2019, so we're five years later and it's even less efficient and less supportive of this organization. Um, and my point being is that we need to make this investment and it is critical for the functioning of the organization. There's, there's one piece that isn't mentioned here is something that Jennifer talked about when she joined the district is that the accounting structure needed to be completely revised before we could ever have implemented that ERP. And that was something that I don't believe was ever brought to the board. Right. Um, at the time, the decision was made to invest in this system. So maybe I wasn't here then, 
but Jennifer identified that as a weakness in terms of implementing an ERP, and Sandra, Jennifer, and the accounting team worked endless hours to correct that weakness so that we could be at a point where we are today where we can implement an ERP. So I want to just acknowledge that there were three years worth of work that took us to get this foundation, a solid foundation, now laid in place. Um, I also want to comment on when we were in the strategic planning uh, sessions probably two years ago now, uh, one of the times I had the chance to sit down with a table filled with staff, and they talked about how the lack of an ERP hindered their ability to work efficiently and effectively. And so I believe, again, that this investment is critical to the long-range efficiency and effectiveness of the district and really appreciate that um, that, that staff perspective, I know, is going to be integrated in part of this work. Um, I also appreciate that in your write-up, that you acknowledge the weaknesses of the prior process because it's through understanding what we didn't do right before that we avoid those pitfalls a second time. So I really appreciate that. And a lot of times I think organizations don't, um, they don't acknowledge things like this in this very transparent and upfront manner. So I, I want to acknowledge that too. So I'm. 100% supportive of this investment, and I think it's going to advance the uh, organization dramatically in years to come. So I appreciate that. We also have Colin Watts on on the line for any questions. And Colin yeah. has questions. Chris, go ahead. I don't wanted to note. It. I just wanted to uh, ensure following up on what. And so the bitter is this still bitter, right? And, and acknowledging, okay, we have to we have to suck it up and we have to go forward. And I'm in favor of that, 100. I just want to ensure that the contract, this contract, the way I read it on page five, covers all three years or all three phases, and there won't be an additional. We're not going to have another million dollars come along because we didn't. I, maybe I'll ask let John and maybe Tyler or Colin can answer that. And, and I have a little comment and about Sandra. that too. Yeah. Um, yes. So no, it sh this should encompass all three years. You can see year one, year two, and year three, those equal the 1.7. Um, but what we did do is we did cut out um, some of the want modules, right? And so potentially when we get to the end and we implement everything that we need, we're focusing on just what we need. We might want to add in the future some bells and whistles. So that could come at a cost. But right now, we just want to get in what we need and have it functioning and operating. So um, we will be having to run two systems for a little while. And that was my very next yeah. question. Yep. Yep. How, how involved, how difficult is that for staff to, to run parallel? It's going to be fun. <laughs> um, but Tom, Tom plays into this. we did reorganize the, the phases, as Greg was mentioning on that staff um, page four, a couple things. So we want to go live at the beginning of, a, of our new year. It's easier. It's a clean cut. It's easier to reconcile, make sure it's working properly. Um, and then we did combine finance and HR before that was split, but they really go hand in hand. Payroll and everything goes hand in hand yeah, with HR. So we are kind of pushing those two to go live together, which will leave just behind um, utility billing, which is a huge part, right? Um, but it will be easier to do the data extract of just that and import into Tyler. So uh, we worked through that quite a bit on how we can finesse and rearrange, and, and Tyler actually recommended that that was a good strategy too. So To add to that, other consultants and other agencies have done the same thing. So you lean on them for some help to some experience, so to go that direction with those applications. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. 
I appreciate the background because I wasn't here. Thank you for that. And I did look up Tyler. They're very reputable. Good company. Um, so I don't understand this at all. Would I boil this down to? Would, would it be fair to say when you guys set out uh, in 18 that there was a certain amount of money that was required for the ERP and a certain amount for the CMMS, and the total of that was the 2.75 million? Yeah. So how much of that, um, how much of this new money that you're asking is going towards the ERP? Because I understand the lucid part, the uh, lucidity issue, and I can understand putting more money towards CMMS, but are we actually short on the ERP as well? Yes, because we essentially have to re re implement and pay for the implementation on Tyler's side again because the district had gone through that implementation unsuccessfully. That's what I don't understand. What was unsuccessful about it? Setaru program. Setaru program was the CMMS program. And that, like we said in here, took took a lot of our effort and money where we had to build build the materials, understand what complexities are within particular uh, maintenance operational activities that are monthly, quarterly, annual. Um, that was built under a software program called Ceteru, who we contracted with at the time. That company, Ceteru, during that period from 2019 to a couple years ago, uh, was bought out I believe, um, and they discontinued the use of CMMS. They can discontinue that line basically altogether. So we were left with a contract with no, no um, company to. So there was no recourse at the time. Actually, the we, yeah, we looked at it. I, honestly, I, I'd have to report back to the board on the details. A colleague of mine in the firm handled this. Yeah, there was a dispute. Was a yeah, we withheld payment of a final invoice. There was no other legal recourse through the contracts. Some of the challenges were when I came, um, there had been a pile of money spent and no, no product to show for anything. I think that one of the fundamental issues was that there was no chance of success with Ceteru being mirrored into Tyler ERP because there are two proprietary softwares and there were some commitments that were originally made that that on behalf of both companies, Federal specifically, that that was going to be kind of a piece of cake. So the idea would be that you have this work order system that also tracks assets, that tracks actual work, uh, materials, supplies, and then it feeds into the financial system. That was never going to happen. So that right there wasted a colossal amount of money, that particular decision. Um, and then when, you know, when, we, when I started kind of looking, because we had, when I was at a previous employer and Sandra and I, we had initiated an ERP and you often see these ERPs fail for one fundamental reason, the finance, the accounting side is a mess. So there was really nothing a whole lot to show for what all this money had been spent on. It was a lot of just spinning of wheels. Um, but the ERP, so the, the problem that I'm having in my head, the ERP system is a database. So there's some computers and there's some software. You yeah. either get it from Oracle or SAP or in this case, Tyler. Like that was purchased, those servers and that software, or the you're, you're paying a subscription, it was all cloud-based. Before I'm just wondering, like, where'd the ERP money go? Before not the integration on, money. Before it was on prem. Yeah. So the ERP money, we do have perpetual licensing. Well, we bought, we purchased the licenses. Okay. So a lot of that money went into the implementation, like Jim first said. And to implement two organization software together, that really. I don't understand the word implementation. So, so you, you bought a product from Tyler. They didn't implement anything, they sold you a license. Right. So now you you were paying to do the integration with this other tool that didn't work out. I understand that. So how much of the one point or two point seven five million 
was for the servers and the licensing for the ERP system. Six hundred and ninety. Yeah, it's in the yeah. It's in the staff report. The rental licenses we own them. And the servers, how much for the? And the servers was about I'm going to say twenty five thousand. We repurposed the servers because they were purchased four years ago. Uh, I mean, the it was internal stuff. You didn't yeah, we we repurposed them. Okay, those servers really are no longer with us anymore. Yeah, the one thing about Tyler, the ERPs are not kind of off the shelf. It's not like uh, Excel or Word where you just jump in. It's customizable to how you do your accounting. Sure. I'm, I'm very so that's what. So what, what I'm trying to understand is if we give you another $1.7 million, what is the likelihood that this succeeds? I will or I won't be here. Well, <laughs> well I, I, think, I, think, I think part of it has to do with a lot of the stuff that we've found out. Jennifer was alluding to the fact that Ceteru was given, we were sold that Ceteru was a plug and play model into ER. It would talk seamlessly. And that, Tyler didn't, like, that, that did not happen. Tyler didn't share the, hey, we don't work with these guys. I don't Tyler, recall. Tyler offered their EAM product at the time. Uh -huh. The leadership that was here at the time said, no, we're not going to go with Okay. So th that's helpful. So we made a decision. Let's go with Ceteru. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I just I want to try to get to the point. So we made a decision at some point to use a CMMS system that wasn't Tyler's. And had we done that at that time, use Tyler's, the integration would have probably gone smoother, even though we'd still have the accounting issues that Jennifer had to clean up. In my view, yes. Okay. Yeah. And that's what we're avoiding here is we're yeah. going only with Tyler. We're also dumbing it down. So a lot of times these systems have large failures because people try to outsmart themselves and be too sophisticated in the implementation in the beginning as opposed to focusing on the essential functions and then building modules as needed later on. Um, there was a lot of just spinning of wheels. I can't really, I wasn't here, so I can't really explain why, but I'm not surprised it failed because of what, how it was being managed at the time. I, I think if I'll add to that and just try to help get to your point is that NID didn't have the internal capacity or capability to understand an ERP system or a CMMS system at all. We had to hire that out to third-party consultants who were a middle organization from NID to both Ceteru and Tyler. Mm -hmm. And so we had to rely upon those organizations as our middle go-to project managers. So we didn't really know what questions, we didn't have the internal capacity to really you know what you fully know. understand what we didn't know. <laughs> Today, we have Sandra and Jennifer have been through, you know, somewhat of, a, of an ERP system. We have, you know, another, the last few years or couple years of talking with Tyler and working with them through and understanding more of their programs um, with their EMM, EMS system integration. So I think we, we know more definitely now than we did then. Um, and we have some internal capacity and internal... So let me capacity. summarize. So maybe we can move on um, we're paying so you I heard dumb it down you said remove some unnecessary modules we're we're being asked to give you guys 62 percent more than the original budget to get less because we're, we're you're actually removing features they're saying okay well we don't really need those modules but to keep the price down this is what we're gonna do that so, it, as, a, as a great payer, that's what I hear. Okay, we're, we're going to pay 62% more than we thought, and we're going to end up with less. Maybe it's a better system at the end of the day, but maybe less features. So I'm okay with that. Um, You're getting the features that you need. Yeah, well, it, there's a point of clarification. The budget that was that shown that was spent previously wasn't an all in cost. You probably, if you would have gone forward with that particular project, it would have cost double that by the time you were done. And you had had features that you didn't, that this district did not need. Yeah, it was, it's not That's even, right. yeah. I know that you're getting less. You're getting everything that we need. No, I, but I don't think that's, the, the point is, is that cost wasn't an all-in cost. You still would have spent another. I think you for sure. Yeah. It's so you were never going to get there. Even if the integration worked, you were never going to get there at 2.7. Oh, no, you right. would have been probably. I, when I first got here, um, 
previous staff that was here managing the project, they asked for, they wanted to bring forth an item to the board the first month I was here. That was another 1.7 to okay. bring forward. Yes. That's helpful. That's correct. And okay. part of the cost increase is, and correct me if I'm wrong, on premise versus the cloud because they're not going to. Yeah, or it's going away. On premise, yes. Yeah, so now it's in the cloud, it's more expensive. SaaS model. With paper SaaS model, so now we, it's almost done. But we paid for the license for the on-prem. So the six hundred thousand for the license is wasted money. That's our license. So what, what's what's the associated recurring cost for the SaaS? Just time on AWS, time maintenance support. What is that in here? Is that what the monthly recurring fee is? That is in there. It's it's a piece of that. It, it, it's not in there the following year in 2026 20, or 2027. Seven. For the following year, that's not there. The ongoing fee, but the SAS model for the SAS fees are in there. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's right here on page five. So you have paid time just to move data up and down. On the, that's an ongoing cost. This is the difference between doing it on prem versus in the cloud. I'm not against it, but the cost analysis. It sounds like it doesn't matter because they don't support on prep anymore. So the six hundred grand for the, the on site license isn't wasted? They're in user licenses. Whether you do a SAS model or an on prem model. Okay. That would be a, that would be unfortunate. No, the whole thing is definitely unfortunate and it's definitely a hard pill to swallow. We wouldn't be making the recommendation to move forward with a new system if I, I truly believe that it's needed just for financial consideration of the district. Yeah. When we need it. How far beyond in the old days are we, right? Well, and remember we made that interim modification. We were on Pantomation. The Pantomation server was dying. We had to do an interim transition up to Central Square, which is Pantomation's parent company's cloud system, and now we're doing the next upgrade. So this is part of the plan we laid out to make that transition, fix the banking transition, fix all of the accounting, fix, make sure everything is reconciled and moving forward. And then now we're coming to this last critical piece, which, you know, it is, it's extremely unfortunate that it didn't work out the first time. I appreciate this conversation because it really laid out yeah. what happened, mm -hmm. where we're at, and a lot of clarification. Um, and we need to take this next step to go forward. And now we're going to go to the public comment. I don't see it on mine. It's not there, Chris. That guy, the Colin. Oh, Colin, yeah. Yeah. Tyler. Yeah, I'm going to give Colin a. <laughs> Poor guy on Zoom. Exactly. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, allowing me to join the meeting today. And um, I just want to reiterate that, uh, you know, we, we, well, first, I do want to, uh, compliment uh, John for his work over the past year and a half that I've been working with him. He's been fantastic to work with. Uh, he's very diligent. He's very detail oriented. He asks um, any question he needs to ask to get the information he needs. And, and as somebody who works hard to, uh, to work with uh, special districts specifically to convey concepts that are, you know, really not everyday concepts for everybody when it comes to uh, things like the cloud and software and automation and workflow and, and things that we deliver to our clients. Um, John did a, a really good job, obviously, with with Jennifer and, and uh, Sandra's help as well to um, give us a platform to uh, to you know explain the value of, of moving forward with this, because this was a very tumultuous project and nobody likes, uh, especially us, to, um, to be in a situation where you know, we have to look back and, and talk about the, the, the bitter and the sweet um, as, as was used earlier in the conversation today. So I just want to acknowledge that um, there is that that bitter and um, that, you know, we've done a lot of work, a lot of legwork here with John and, and the rest of the staff here at NIG to, to make sure that this going forward plan is going to work. Um, so thanks to your staff. The other thing I just wanted to mention was I, I know that there is uh, 
obviously very justifiable concern about cost here. Um, so a couple of uh, points I wanted to uh, make are one, that um, when we uh, crafted the, when we crafted a proposal for a customer who was using our system on-premise, which NID was initially beginning in 2019, um, when we move them to the cloud, uh, a couple things happen. One, we do use a credit to offset the cost of annual maintenance, which was about $130,000. And we credited that and, and that was applied into how we priced the, um, the, 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 the current quote that, uh, that, that we're discussing today. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, we, we did uh, work out, uh, again, I think with Jennifer's leadership primarily, to uh, come up with a contract amendment that uh, that waived the annual maintenance of what NID was paying for for two full years, which is a very rare and uncommon thing uh, in the software industry. So that, again, that saved another uh, two years of about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars of annual fee. So all in all, you know, we've we've tried to be a good partner for NID, and uh, we're looking forward to continuing the project, obviously. Um, and I uh, would also go from there to the point that uh, was also discussed about, you know, maybe getting, uh, aside from being called a Pinto, which I, I don't necessarily think <laughs> our, our product is going to uh, have any issues if it gets rear-ended, but um, I'm old enough to remember that those days. But my, um, you know, I understand the point of, uh, well, so if we're, we're getting less and paying more, um, I think the things that were placed into our optional section of our proposal are things that, as Sandra pointed out, could be valuable for the district later. So we've we've offered to remove those from today's cost and put them into a bucket where if the district elects to add those later, we will hold the price on those and not increase the price on those should the district elect to, to add those components of software. Um, so we're, we're offering some price guarantee there. Um, we've also uh, uh, come up with a creative way to align the payment of the SAS fees to the uh, initiation of each of these phases. So for instance, the utility billing phase and the EAM phases, those will begin you know, 18 to 24 months out and uh, NID will not have to pay the SAS fees on those until those phases begin. So that was something that John asked um, and you know, I think was a very good financial stewardship of NIDs uh, for NIDs ratepayers and, and constituents. And we, we agreed to do that. Um, so really I, 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 I my point here, I guess, is I'm just trying to say that I appreciate the the costliness of this effort. Um, I can tell you that, you know, with the uh, hundreds of different municipalities in California that we've worked with, many of which are special districts, um, that we've delivered a lot of efficiencies that we're proud of, and we're gonna we're gonna work hard to do the same for NID. Um, and I think you'll see the value in this, um, you know, as it begins to roll out here in, in the next, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months, where we really sort of get into the details, into the weeds of of getting this product implemented for you. Um, and in the cloud, you know, a couple of things were brought up about uh, cloud security. Obviously we're hosted in AWS. We offer a, um, a service level agreement in our contract that provides protection for all of our customers for things like uptime and uh, data security. Um, we always publish our reports for customers for all of our audits uh, for uh, our cloud hosting. Um, all of that will be inf uh, information that's available to you at any time. Um, we back up everything to our cloud uh, nightly, so all of our customers are protected in that regard. And it's uh, being in AWS does have multiple locations. So from a cloud perspective, um, you're in the top of the line uh, in terms of, of uh, your data security and your information security, which is critical, uh, particularly when you're dealing with uh, human resource uh, information. Um, so oh, my hope is that, uh, yes, please go ahead. On the so, so I see here is three hundred sixty-five thousand in year three for the SAS fee. Is that the on? Will that be every year plus some percentage going forward? So that's the kind of baseline fee, and that yes, that includes so AWS as well as your guys's fees, or is there an is that all in? It's, okay. Yep, that, that's all in. So that the annual SAS fee includes your licensing your maintenance, all of your support. So, um, and by the way, any future enhancement we make to the product um, and, uh, and or to the technology that is running behind the product is all included in that. So you're never gonna pay for another upgrade. You're never gonna pay for an enhancement to the software. Um, you'll have round the clock support on your product. 
not only support for the product itself, staffed by people in the U.S. who understand the products that, that your staff are working with, many of whom probably implemented those products, but also a separate support line for our hosting center. So if you ever have an issue, if John C. Weber has an issue trying to access the system or an NID employee can't seem to get in, there's a direct line right to the technical side of the house that is not focused on the, the functional side. Uh, th those are two separate um, areas of support. Um, and uh, your perpetual licensing. So yes, everything is included and we're taking care of all the hardware and database refresh for you as well. So you never have to worry about um, you know, trying to migrate the servers. We'll, we do all that. Uh, full stop for, for every element of the, uh, the hosting going forward. And then we also, uh, to answer the other part there about the, the lift, we're keeping this rate um, the same. We're, we're phasing it in, as I mentioned. And then um, that's for the initial three-year term. Beyond that, we've committed to only increase those amounts by a small amount in years four and five. And we put that all into the contract, again, to offer some predictability for the district. Appreciate it. So the, the only last question that I have to tie a bow on this one. So the 365 plus whatever percentage you guys agree for is four and five. Uh, that's new money to the budget? Or is is some of that being spent today that's kind of recovered? Like is is there already 150,000 going into the budget for SAS that gets thrown away and now we're doing 365? Or is it all new Here, money? Four and five, it will be new. We'll have to add that to the budget. This is the 1.7 million is for the next three years. I know, but what I'm saying is your ongoing IT costs today, there's not an ERP component to that outside of this. Well, there's a small component associated with Central Square. What, what's that amount? Like, I'm, I'm trying I to think it's out, like an offset that we're A little about. bit of an offset, but Central not Square much. is not that much. What is Central Square? 120? Yes. 120k. I, I th it's between 80 and 120 okay. from my so ongoing. We could say it's like 300k or 230k extra money every year. Ongoing fee. Say, that's about right. So like quarter mm -hmm. month. Okay, got it. Thank you. That was all I have. That's including CMS too. Yeah. <laughs> Comment about uh, the paying more for less. We haven't talked about accounted for what's happened in our economy the past four years either the inflation stuff you know maybe maybe Colin could answer that question but I, I suspect that's part of the you know everything's going up right well the I would not attribute the the costs in our proposals to inflation um you know we we manage costs pretty closely obviously we're a public company so all, all of that is public information um, but, uh, you know, in, inflation has not, um, been a factor when it comes to how we price this for NID. Now, what, so, uh, sometimes we get questions, sorry, oh, well, will you guarantee your price for 10 years? In those cases, obviously, you know, no organization would do that because you don't know what cost structures are going to be like 10 years from now, but we are off, you know, that's why we, we look at three-year terms initially, and then we try to cap years four and five just to provide some financial relief for our customers in the near term uh, to a to a reasonable a reasonable time period that's that's predictable. Uh, there is one small uh, adjustment on the resolution, the fifth whereas that number is not 393461, it is should be read 393031. That fifth whereas that's the only change to the resolution itself that I would recommend uh, if we get to the point of calling for an authorization. We make that adjustment. So do we have any more public comments? Any public comment? Questions? So public comment is closed. Directors, any questions? Motion? I make a motion. Move that we adopt resolution 2024-32, authorize an amendment to the fiscal year 2024 CIP and approval and approval of Tyler Minus ERP contract. A second. Second. Roll call, please. Division two. Aye. Division three. 
Aye. Division four. Aye. Division five. I'm sorry, Division one. <laughs> 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 yes. Uh, Division five. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank Look forward to getting started. Thank we, you, Colin. We expect a, but, a lot from you, and it sounds like you're going to deliver. So thank you. We're, we're ready to do it. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Bye. So, power through? Yes, please. Okay. So, we're 5C. And it's the contract and budget amendment for the Deer Creek Powerhouse. This should be a fairly quick item. As the board is aware, we took ownership of the Deer Creek Powerhouse in about the January timeframe after the 2024 budget was already completed. This is a capital project that's required for the powerhouse. It's to replace the existing exciter that's, I think, vintage 1970s. Don't ask me, I'm not a huge electrical person, but it apparently regulates current in some manner. There you go. Um, so we, yeah, we are requesting authorization to award a contract as well as it, um, create a new capital project. Any questions? Questions? One. Yeah. How are we doing on hiring a director? Awesome. <laughs> As, you're taking away my general manager report. Oh, well, it is. I mean, it's yeah. hydroelectric. I'll give you a sneak peek of what I was going to say later. But um, yeah, we have somebody who is accepted, and we'll announce the name as soon as he clears background. Yeah. And we're very excited. He's going to be amazing. Yay. Yeah. Oh, we got all kinds of really good. Yeah. Uh, Chris, Ricky, questions? No questions. No questions. Karen? No, nope, good. All good. Uh, I have, so we're approving a balance and then you're reducing the Chicago Park by 150000 but the consulting agreement. What, I'm not sure what you're talking about. That's, well, the third part of the uh, resolution. The consulting agreement to uh, GS, GS Engineering. engineering. Can we explain more what they do? Engineering design and integration services. Yeah, it's yeah. a piece of equipment. We saw a lot of times these are more kind of design build type projects. Tanya could speak a little bit more to it. Is that correct, Tanya? Yes, that's it, trying to be her down in the engineering here. Um, that is correct, Jennifer. So the consultant will be tasked with designing the exciter to be ordered and then the integration part. We're spending 150000 on it, but 90000 more for consulting. And that's pretty normal. Electrical type of projects like this, or um, kind of electrical equipment, they, it usually is a much higher percent, design is a much higher percentage than the purchase of the equipment itself, than like a normal construction project. I'd like to note the amount that actually for the equipment is just the down payment for it. Oh. oh, really? Yeah. So once uh, once GSC is on board, they'll do the design portion of it. And once we have the specifications for the exciter to Basler, that will be sent to Basler for a final quote. And but during that pro during the initial process, they had developed the preliminary specification, and they received that preliminary quote from Basler. And so that portion or the down payment was noted there. And that's due to the lead time of the product. It's about four months for lead time after we have the approval of the actual final design. So, Do you have a sense of how much the cost is, the final cost is going to be? If this is just a down payment? Unfortunately, I do not have that the number. Range? Will we be getting a more of an overview of the whole upper Deer Creek powerhouse than just this one piece of equipment? Will, they, will uh, GS Consulting Engineering look at everything that's kind of going on in there 
So, and not just this uh, cider. Cider. <laughs> yeah, their their contract is direct. Yeah, that, that contract. For the cider. Yeah, so. that's not associated with a review of the powerhouse. Is so. My I guess my question is when you go when I was at the land trust and we took over the North Star house, the big thing was look at the whole house and and not just the roof. You know, so that's what staff does. Huh? Staff operates the powerhouse, they have taken so a look. They know what yeah. okay. that's my concern is that we're we're looking at the whole thing. Good. Um, another case of never mind. PG&E wearing out a piece of equipment. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, we get to I was going to make a cogent comment about that. And go, you know, we could spend a lot of money on an old plant. And, uh, what's our net profit? Estimated $300,000 a year or something. Pretty minimal. We're not uh, there yet. No, we're not there. But just keep keep that in the back of our mind. Okay. Any more questions? Um, Public comment. Uh, I, public comment is closed. So, what is the payback period on this? How many years will we pay off this new piece of equipment? Uh, probably about one year. The powerhouse actually does really well. Yeah. I mean, we've only ran it for a it's short really period of time, but water yeah. Water yeah. Water has been ready. Right. All right. Uh, do we have a motion? Well, okay. I move Oops, sorry. approval of the 2024 fund five capital budget amendment to fund a new capital project, Deer Creek Powerhouse Excitation Upgrade, project number 2395, and authorize general manager to execute. Roll call, please. Aye. 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 Yes. Yes. All right. So we go to 5D, which is uh, contract and budget amendment for the Ore Creek siphon replacement. That's combi over two and three. Yeah, this one should also be fairly quick. So the um, current 2024 budget does include this project in it. We did put the project out to bid. The bids came back in higher. So we are requesting authorization to increase the budget for the already approved capital project, as well as award a construction contract um, to C&D contractors. The, we will not require an additional transfer from, from 10 to fund 15 because we do have some cost savings associated with a uh, previous project, which has not been able to move forward as fast, and that is implementation of the charging stations. Um, and that is the delay is simply due to a lot of the interconnection issues with the current grid. Public comment. Uh, seeing no public comment, directors? Well, um, I noted that the pipe size is increasing from 30 to 48 inches in diameter, and I wondered if you could comment on that, Jennifer, and how it supports our customers. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Tanya again. Um, so the, the pipe size was sized for master plan flow, but we also add some emergency flow so that we can backfeed into the combi over 3D system. So that's why we have an increase in pipe size. So it goes to the master plan for the area? Yes, so whenever we do design for the project, it is sized as master plan, but in this case, plus an emergency flow. Does it have an emergency flow right now? We can backfeed right now, but it's not sized for the quantity that operations have requested. So this will account for both the future value and the amount operations requested. The future value? So master plan flow numbers uh, projected out for these are plans like 20 years ahead. So right now we could be selling a certain number 
but we always size for 20 years ahead. Okay, so it allows for, ultimately, this is allowing for growth in the service delivery in Placer County. Is that correct? Okay. Plus the emergency fund. Thank you. And the same thing was done for the Hoagland plume uh, that was replaced um, over a decade ago. I think it went from 24 inches to 36, just for the all the farmers out in Penn Valley. Thank you. <laughs> um, any questions, Trevor? I just want to comment. It's great to see C and D, a local contractor, mm -hmm. getting the bid. Yes. Yes, it is. They do great work. All right. Uh, no public comment and roll we'll call, please. We have a motion? No. Oh, we better get yeah. one, huh? Better get a motion. <laughs> Jennifer wanted to move this on fast, so we were. <laughs> so I'll we have make a motion. A motion. Um, I'll make a motion to approve 2024 Fund 15 Water Capital Budget Amendment inner, fund, inner transfer of funds from project number 2689 to project number 2645. Award of construction contract with C and D contractors for construction of the Ore Creek siphon replacement, a component of the Combi Ofer two and three siphon replacement project. I'll second that. Excellent. Roll call, please. Division two. Aye. Division three. Aye. Division four. Aye. Division one. Yes. Division five. Yes. All right. General Manager's report. Oh, Director Calder stole my thunder when he was asking my question. <laughs> no. We have somebody to direct the team. We do, and he's going to be great. So we do anticipate probably October 1st start date, um, and we will make the announcement as soon as all the background is done, and he's notified his current employer. And that's all we really have for right now. Good. Oh, directors, no report. My report is that I had COVID for two weeks, so I didn't have a lot other than linear. Ouch. Here we go. Karen? I uh, was able to do a tour of the Heinz water treatment plant as well as the Combi Reservoir, and I want to acknowledge the, uh, this was with the uh, LOP Lakes and Parks Committee, and Justin, Kobe, and Steve from NID provided the tour, and they were exceptional. They answered a lot of questions, clarified the flow of the water. Um, our, our LOP water treatment plant is very impressive, and um, the Lakes and Parks Committee really appreciated the staff's time. And I also separately want to acknowledge uh, Aaron, who manages part of the Placer County uh, Canal System, and Frank, who manages both uh, Placer and part of uh, South Nevada <coughs> County water systems. They, they've been very responsive um, in answering questions and providing service to customers and troubleshooting. And you know, it just goes once again. Our those water system operators go above and beyond to provide excellent customer service, and it's so apparent in the their caring and um, commitment to service is so apparent in how they interface. So really appreciate that. Nothing for me. Um, I want to shout out to. Uh, well, Chris and Susan Lauer, and also I think Jennifer had a lot to do. So, and Pasquale at Yuba Nat, this is um, plan for water final technical memorandum is released. But the notice itself is significant in the sense that it really hits the high points of what the plan for water was and what the issues are. So, I, I just recommend. Pascual, if you could keep that up on, or get it, you know, closer when we look at it next month. Um, this is a, a very valuable document in itself. Okay. So thank you. Okay. And um, because this is what 
the other document looks like and <laughs> the full document and try to make sense of it. You know, I mean, there's so much data and technical information. Uh, it's incredible to have the backup, but, you know, we need to look at the big picture too and what works, what doesn't. Uh, so anyway, thank you for doing that. Also, um, yeah, there's other things going on, but uh, it's all good. So uh, we're adjourned. Thank you.